Ahal bonjour, Jacques. Uh, speaking to you today from uh, inside my office. It's a, a, <laughs> a fifth wheel. I got parked in my barn. Anyway, uh, this is the first part of a, a series of videos that uh, Sam and I are going to be doing. Uh, as I may have mentioned to y'all in the past, uh, concerning Anishinaabe philosophy, kind of exploring it a little bit, and we're, we're going to be uh, getting some people that are a bit more knowledgeable, hopefully, to talk to us about it, uh, but I want to kind of go through some basics, uh, as I understand it, and as Sam understands it, uh, with folks before before we can go on. Uh, I think there's a lot of misconceptions, especially given that academia, uh, especially the humanities and social sciences, are really predominantly um, uh, people in the postmodernist disciplines. And uh, they have a tendency to assimilate other uh, groups, especially those that they consider uh, uh, marginalized and uh, Native American groups fall into that. Uh, unfortunately, in order to sort of assimilate uh, uh, Native Americans into the argument of their um, ideology, they uh, sort of have to, to create this sort of pan-Indian idea rather than uh, understanding the individual nations themselves. And uh, so, uh, for a lot of folks, um, and I, I noticed this with, if you're a language student, um, understanding how Potawatomi, what, what the Potawatomi outlook towards the world is, is kind of important and may vary a bit from uh, a lot of uh, Western perceptions. Um, so, uh, folks, especially language students, you know, may f fall into the the trap of adopting, um, you know, really postmodernist intersexual identity politics and that sort of thing, uh, and and all the baggage that comes with it, uh, political ideology and, and and a lot of stuff like that. They may end up dragging that into uh, their perception of the world and it won't it won't uh, serve them very well so I think it's more important to um, lay out some basic understandings and as I said I'm going to try and get people definitely more qualified than me or Sam to come in here and talk with us about it at some point in the future we're going to be uh, right after the new year, we're going to be upgrading a lot of our equipment. We'll be doing much better quality videos, and um, and uh, we're going to hopefully be able to have live discussion uh, between multiple people. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we wanted to lay out some, some of the basics right off the bat and try and dispel some misconceptions before we move forward. Uh, even in, in trying to learn and understand uh, uh, Anishinaabe philosophy, so to speak. So, uh, this one, this episode is, is going to explore property rights. Um, I'm going to do a video here with you where I'm going to talk about property rights a little bit. And then um, after that, uh, Sam is going to, we're going to have, Sam's produced another video. Uh, that's going to explore um, intellectual property rights and the commons and his perceptions of it from a Potawatomi perspective, from someone who has tried to uh, explore and learn about being a traditional uh, Potawatomi person. And so first off, I'm going to cover some of the basics on property rights. Now, uh, myth number one that uh, you will never hear from the postmodernist uh, perspective is yes there were property rights property rights did exist they were part of uh, Anishinaabe society and there's no getting around it 
and there's lots of examples of, of property rights. Um, for instance, I mean, I can give you some very hard, concrete examples. Um, uh, there's a, a, a thing called Manumin binding, where uh, wild rice patties, you know, uh, Manumin would would be people would women specifically um, because you know in the old days mainly ricing was was a woman's thing. Um, in the old days, they would and still do in some places bind the tops of the manumen together uh, to make uh, delineations of this is my space where I do my ricing. <clears throat> Especially in situations where you had, uh, you know, a, a, a larger population and, uh, and more limited resources, uh, you would see uh, manumen binding become a, a very common thing. Um, other aspects of agriculture, uh, women, you know, did most of the agricultural work back in the old days. And, uh, so, um, women would pass down their fields, uh, to their daughters. Now, if that isn't a concrete example of property rights, I, I don't know what is, right? Um, but it wasn't just women. Uh, when it comes to hunting grounds, there were certain hunting grounds that were sort of uh, considered commons, but then there were also areas that specifically different clans, uh, Dodem, would lay claim to. Uh, and so the various families would, uh, would hold uh, specific areas as hunting grounds. And it would be known, and they'd make it known to, to others, this is, this is my space where I hunt. Uh, so these are all examples of maybe primitive ones. Of course, they're, you know, they we're not talking about deeds or, you know, written documents. But uh, certainly within the Dodem system, which is, by the way, Dodem is more than just your extended family. It is, in its, in its very essence, a legal system. And... Uh, and, and this can be backed up by examples uh, in the old days when, um, you know, and we're talking hundreds of years ago, when uh, treaties would be signed between uh, the English and the French governments and, and Anishinaabe groups. Uh, it wouldn't just, one, one hereditary chief, you know, wasn't, for one thing, hereditary chiefs didn't exist back then. The hereditary chief system was installed by the created and installed by the U.S. government um, here in this country, uh, and uh, was an effort to undermine the Dodem. So, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm digressing a little bit. But if you look at the these old the the really old um, treaties. Uh, there's not just one chief signing, touching the pen for the 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 whole uh, band or tribe. Uh, rather, uh, there are many different signatures, and what these men would do is draw little images. Uh, you may see an image of a crane. You may see an image of a lightning bolt or a thundercloud. Uh, these things rep represented their clan. So, you know, like uh, if you saw like a, a lightning bolt or a thundercloud or something like that on there, it, it's, it represents uh, the thunder clan. Uh, you, you know, if it's an image of a, of a crane, you know, it represents that clan. If it's an image of a bear or a bear's paw print, uh, 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 this is a, a, you know, the, the signature of the headman of or or ogima of that particular clan and so you would see you know in these these uh documents there would be dozens of of signatures all of these are ogima for their clan within that village or or group or area 
Um, so it is definitely a legal system. And, uh, and a, a, a essentially a almost governmental kind of structure. Uh, it, it was such, in some ways, such an efficient uh, system for itself that it didn't really require government. There's no taxation, there's no nothing like that going on. Um, just really, you know, a, a, uh, a very voluntary kind of society. So yes, there were property rights. People had property rights. Certain uh, and and the whole idea of rights definitely exists. Uh, so these are not, um, you know, exclusively Western European ideas. Uh, and uh, property rights was a thing. Um, Oftentimes, you know, the postmodernists or, or leftist types will try and tell you that, you know, there was this sort of socialist communist system. It's not the case. Not at all. Uh, I'm, just because people engage in charity, uh, you know, helping each other out, doesn't mean that it's socialism, you know, that because there's no government forcing people to do it or extracting uh, there's no central planner extracting resources from one group of people and giving it to others so it's uh, you know you, you have to understand that there's a difference between charity and you know social programs and was it some sort of primitive form of communism in fact I think uh, it was Karl Marx who sort of posited that idea and I think that's based on the fact that he never met a Native American in his life and uh, and certainly not a, a, an Anishinaabe person and uh, the man you know lived in Europe and and so his ideas of uh, indigenous Americans would be kind of skewed uh, and, and come from a, a, a place of ignorance so you can't really uh, you can't really put any faith in in you know that thing. It's kind of a ridiculous notion, and uh, certainly you know there was trade, there was um, property rights. Uh, uh, I mean, they, you know, if you if you consider uh, beaver pelts and uh, and um, uh, wampum uh, th there was even really th those in a sense were financial instruments uh, very primitive ones but nevertheless financial instruments so you know th these are currencies right and uh, and so um, you can't uh, uh, it it's not logical to accept this uh, notion that somehow, uh, uh, you know, our ancestors were these uh, proto-communists. It's, it's ridiculous, okay? Uh, and it's just, it's just inaccurate. It's not true. So the best thing to do is to try and learn about these things. Now, I think, you, you know, and I, I know folks' resources and sometimes their access to other people in the tribe um, uh, is difficult so it's hard to learn about these things and that's why you end up with these kind of misconceptions um, and so you know reading material helps right and in the days of the internet we not only can communicate with each other more um, than we could before but also you know you have access to uh, resources uh, at the tip of your fingers. Uh, one that I will recommend to you if you're interested in exploring this or you, you're saying hey, Richard Abbey's full of it and uh, doesn't know what he's talking about, I'm gonna look it up and prove that we were uh, uh, proto-communists. Well if you don't believe me 
I understand. Look up the book, find the book called The Manitous uh, by Basil Johnston. Uh, now, here we have a, a, a book written by a, a very well respected PhD who also happens to be an Anishinaabe person himself. And uh, he's passed away, I believe, last year. Um, anyway, brilliant guy. And he really just the introduction uh, if you want to understand uh, you know a lot about political uh, and um, philosophical uh, uh, positions um, held in the pre-Columbian eras um, then his book his introduction uh, in the book the Manitous is excellent it's uh, it's actually pretty long and covers a lot of ground but uh, this is where I got a lot of my information from and uh, I hope it can serve you well as well uh, so that's uh, basically it that's my position on property rights uh, from a Anishinaabe perspective uh, part two will be Sam Navar uh, discussing intellectual property rights and how it relates to um, to to people um, now th here's you know kind of a, a touchy subject uh, because you know there are folks who argue about whether the language should be shared there are folks who argue uh, about um, the sharing of songs and uh, and things things like that and that's really the area of intellectual property Personally, I feel that intellectual property is meh, uh, kind of anti-property rights, really, um, or in opposition to property rights. But uh, I know that a lot of folks have some very uh, sore feelings about that thing, that sort of thing, especially in a time when people are arguing over cultural appropriation and things like that, which, once again, the postmodernists rear their ugly heads um and uh and so we have to be a little bit careful about how we perceive that and and what kind of negative effects it can have uh because people start claiming intellectual property rights for instance to the language which there are some examples of that uh when 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 that starts happening what the the real effect is from that is going to be that uh people are just not going to learn and it's going to limit the amount of people who actually learn and use the language and that's a problem that, that's not good not good for us and not good for the people not good for Potawatomi culture so um, the other thing issue he's going to be exploring I'll weigh in myself personally uh, uh, a bit is the idea of the commons and what is the commons uh, from the Anishinaabe perspective? Um, and I think, you know, certainly in, in those days, maybe the commons was, in the old days, the commons was probably viewed more as, um, as an inevitability. Uh, and uh, you just sort of tried to carve your property out of, out of a, a vast commons, you know, that existed. Um, but, you know, much of the commons would be unusable. And, uh, so people would want to, um, create property, essentially, um, out of, you know, the land and resources that were the best available, uh, for their purposes. Anyway, Sam's going to explore that more in the next episode. That'll be coming up. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, Miigwech, uh, appreciate your, uh, your watching, and uh, if you care to support uh, our uh, channel and what we do here at the farm, uh, feel free to uh, become a patron on our Patreon page, uh, that's uh, patreon.com slash Richard um, with no space in between Richard and Abby. Um, and uh, if you care to make a one-time donation, 
Uh, you can do that uh, through PayPal at richardabbey6 at gmail.com. Bama B. Miigwech.